Uh, tomorrow, of course, is Labor Day. And uh, I've, I've, I mentioned this morning, I always wondered where Labor Day came from. You know, now, I, I worked in uh, Allegheny Ludlam for 33 years. Brother Dale here, he worked here for about 30. Uh, and, you know, Todd, Pastor Todd works there even right today. He works there. And uh, there's a lot of people who've worked at Allegheny Ludlam and people who have worked in mills. My dad worked there. And uh, at one time in this area, there were steel mills and coal mines and, and factories and manufacturing. Most of that has either gone south or gone to India somewhere. You know, they've you know, shipped a lot of that out. But thank God we still have... A, you know, manufacturing. At one time, when I was a when I was a kid, well, a kid, when I got out of high school, I went to uh, I went to college for a year. And uh, the only reason I went to college for years because I wanted to get away from home and have a good time. <laughs> so I did. I got away from home and I had a good time, but I didn't have a whole lot of money. There's, there's nothing to show for. And uh, so I got a, at that time the, the, the mill would hire people for the summer. I got a summer job over Allegheny Ludlam because my dad worked there. You know, and. Uh, so they hired me for the summer, and I took a look at the paycheck. I think most of you guys have heard my testimony. I took a look at the paycheck, and I said, well, this looks pretty good. So I, I said, maybe I'll work here for a couple of years and go back to school. Well, 33 years later, <laughs> I was still. At, uh, and, and, you know, that, at that time, those kind of jobs were pretty abundant, but those jobs aren't around anymore. That doesn't happen anymore. I, I would never say to a kid today, well, yeah, you know, go get a job in the mill. It just doesn't happen. But... Uh, but one of the things when you work in Allegheny Lone Steel Corporation, you became a member of the United Steelworkers of America, the union. And every time, every payday, they took union dues out your paycheck, you know. Now, uh, I, you know, I kind of like had a, a mixed emotions. I'm glad, I, I'm glad, uh, I'm not really crazy about unions. I'm, I'm not crazy about their politics and their, you know, because they're all very liberal, you know. But I'm glad I had one at Allegheny Ludlam because... Uh, the reason why unions exist, and I'm, I'm going to get into the word in a minute, I am on. The reason why unions exist is because back in the 1800s during the Industrial Revolution, when, when America went from being an agrarian society, a farming society, to a manufacturing society, the, the moguls who owned these companies, they, you know, their, their purpose was they wanted to make money. So the steel companies and the coal mines and the, and the railroads, they would hire people and not necessarily treat them the best. They would give them uh, meager wages, uh, bad hours, no safety at all, no safety at all. And if somebody would get hurt or killed at it, work, they would just like throw them aside and put somebody else in. It was just like another cog in the wheel. So uh, a lot of the workers said, hey, you know, this is, uh, this, does not, this is not right. And they started to get together with the unions. And of course, what started out is, was something with like a noble cause has really pretty much turned into a, uh, just another corporation. Dale and I were talking about it the other day that, you know, I worked for Allegheny Ludlam and I worked for the United Steelworkers, you know, paying my dues. But uh, the thing is, uh, back in the 1800s, when they would have a strike, I mean, it would get bloody. They would start shooting. You know, the, uh, I know John and I, we've talked before about the Homestead steel strike, you know, when... They called the Pinkertons, and I think that was like 1882 or something like that. Uh, and so they were, you know, I mean, it got nasty. I mean, now you carry signs and you, you know, say, yell things. But uh, we, went, we went on strike back in 94. I'll never forget it. They, it was like, we want more in 94. That was the, that was the, that was the thing. And uh, no, I didn't. And, you know, I was said, well, I remember they, would, they want us to go walk on the picket lines, you know. So I would go and, and stand on the picket line. And uh, everybody took their turns, you know. And uh, they, they came around one time and they gave us baseball caps. You know, United Steelworkers baseball caps. I said, that's my like $5,000 baseball cap. Okay, that's about what it cost me. But uh, we really didn't get a whole lot. But the thing is, that's what, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. That's, that's the uh, Steelworkers Union and unions in general. Uh, and I was thinking the, 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 the mindset of the American working class today it really does not line up with the mindset of this and the mindset of the of the corporate people don't line up with this because the bottom line is our society I think it's, it's fair to say that what drives our economy is greed it's greed it's greed on top 
It's greed at the bottom and greed in the middle. Why are we paying skyrocketing health care costs? Because you have doctors who will stop in and say hello and charge you $200. You have people that if they gave you three aspirins instead of two, they want to get a lawyer and you know, they want to call it your Snyder. And in between you've got the lawyers who are making the laws and everything and they're the ones that stand to, okay, so everybody has their hand out. Everybody's looking, looking to gain. And you know, if somebody's gaining, somebody got to lose somewhere, right? So why do we have skyrocketing costs? What do we, what we've seen in the last 10 years, we've seen, uh, you know, Enron, and we've seen these wealthy, unbelievably wealthy people, Bernie Madoff, the biggest, a billion dollar Ponzi scheme, you know, uh, ripping off, you know, just people with all kinds of money. And uh, we, we've, we've seen, you know, the bailout with, you know, just recently our government decided they were going to give uh, corporate welfare to these people. They gave them millions and billions of dollars and they took vacations. You know, so, uh, you know, AIG and all this stuff. So we've seen all these things happen. We live in a society that is being driven our economy. The reason why our economy is tanking, it's no longer like supply and demand. It's give me more. It's greed. It's greed. And it's, it's on top, on the bottom, and in the middle. And uh, I was wanted to read, it's one of my favorite passages because it makes me feel like I don't have to feel bad because I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, Paul was writing his friend Timothy, and he says, uh, he gives us these. Now, this, this first verse, if you said, stood, this up, uh, stood up in the union meeting and said this, they would probably tar and feather you. The it was 150 years ago. He said, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Now, we're not, you know, we don't live in a time where people are servants and slaves and so forth. But we have employees and employers, okay? And the Bible tells us employees and employers should treat each other right. Employers should be willing and ready to pay their, their, their workers a, a good wage and treat, treat them well. Workers should be willing to, to do a good job and earn their money and treat their, their employers with respect and so forth. But it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really seem to pan out today. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. See, it's one thing, if, if, if I would go to work in Allegheny Ludlam and say, yeah, I tell them I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor and this and that and uh, all that, and, I, and I, I sit around all day, you know, reading the newspaper and not doing my job, what's that say about Jesus? What's it say about Jesus? And you could put it on the other, on, uh, other hand, if I'm an employer, if I'm a, a foreman of some kind, and I treat, and I say, yeah, hallelujah, glory to God, and I treat my people like dogs, what does that say about Jesus? We should always have foremost in our thinking, what are they going to think about Jesus? If I'm going to, you know, if you don't want to think that, don't tell them you're a Christian. <laughs> don't wear the t-shirt. Don't, you know, don't do that. But if, if you, you can't help but let people know if you're saved. So if you're saved, and you want them to know you're saved, treat them like Jesus would treat them. Uh, uh, and, and act that way. So it says, As many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. That's hard sometimes. I don't know about you, but you know, when I, I worked at, in, in the mill for 33 years, and most of the bosses I had were good, but I had a few that were rascal. I had a few that I did not get along with. And they didn't get along with me. <laughs> and I used to pray and say, Lord, help me get along. I mean, I had to, you know, when you're in the mill, sometimes... You kind of, you know, find yourself slipping a little bit of things you say. So I had to like really pray and say, Lord, I don't, I don't want to say what I feel like saying. I don't want to say what I would have said before I got saved. You know, because those, those things are still buried in there. I don't care what anybody says. That's, that, you know, the potential of like really. So I had to pray a few times. But, but, but you know, but I had respect. And I tried to do a good job. I tried to do my eight hours. Okay. Now listen to what it says. I know I, there were a few days when I didn't, but I tried. Okay, verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service. Because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. Now there was actually in Paul's day, when he was writing this, there was in the Roman Empire, there was slavery. It wasn't slavery like we think of it. It wasn't like American slavery. It was a racial thing. But it was, they would, they would conquer a land and they would bring people back and make them slaves. And some of the slaves were like household slaves. They were, they were not always like, you know, out trudging. And, you know, there were different levels of, of, uh, of uh, servitude. 
And, and, and it was very possible that there could be a Christian slave owner and a Christian slave. Now somebody say, that doesn't make sense because slavery, you would think they would let them go. But that was the reality of the time. Paul wasn't condoning slavery. Some people would read this and say, oh, the New Testament says it's okay to have slaves. It doesn't say that. It just recognized the fact that in the Roman Empire at that time, that was, that was a, a fact of life. There were slaves. If you read uh, uh, the little letter of Philemon, Paul wrote that letter to, a, to a, a, a man named Philemon about an escaped slave named Onesimus. And you can read about that. It's just a few verses long. It's a very short letter. But Paul exhorted uh, uh, Philemon to receive him back uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a brother. Not that he was going to you know, just set him free and let him go. He was still anchored there. He still had, he had a job to do there. But that relationship between slave owner and slave, it, it took a whole different a whole different picture if both were believers in Jesus Christ. Okay. So, he, so Paul was addressing that. Of course, we don't really have that today. And thank God we don't have that today. But listen to what he says. Verse 3. If any man teach otherwise... Now, now listen. See, when you get... Well, I, every, every month I get a, 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 a publication from the United Steelworkers. Okay? Because even though I'm retired, I'm still like a retired steelworker. And, and uh, one time there was a, there was a, there was a poem. Uh, what was the name of the poem? It was called uh, the, the Steelworker's Prayer or something like that. I, I forget. It was something. And it was like real, like, you know. And I read this. I read this thing and I think they, they should change the name to The Whiner's Prayer. Okay, because what you find sometimes is that people, how many people know what, what whining is? Okay. Not that anybody here has ever done any of it. Yeah. Whining. Okay. <clears throat> now, <laughs> okay. Again, I'll just use myself as an example. Okay. Now, I retired from the mill back in 05. Okay. And they, they tried to talk me. They talked me into retiring. They said, we want all that. We want the 300 oldest guys in the mill to retire. And they gave you a little bit of your retirement and this and that, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay. So it says, all right, so you got health care. Not going to take the HMO, HMO, it doesn't cost you anything. So that sounds good to me. So, about two years later, I get a letter in the mail saying, you're going to have to start paying 80 bucks a month for your health care. I said, okay, that's really good. A lot of people, 80 bucks a month for health care, that's, that's a steal. <laughs> well, now they just got a new contract, and guess what? They tripled that for me. Okay, now here's the thing, here's what I'm saying. I, I'm, I, I, I get with guys that are retired like me, and oh, they're just like, oh, my, oh, my, oh my. You, you know, because they're going to pay this money. I said, you know what, if you go to anybody on the street and say, hey, we'll give you health care for 250 bucks a month, and, and, you know, with the kind of coverage we have, and, and ask them, they'll say, where do I sign? Okay, I was just talking, talking to a guy, he said, he pays like 600 bucks a month, and he, he got like a $2,000 deductible. I mean, we don't know how good we have it. Sure, I'm, yeah, I wasn't counting on spending that extra money every month, but you know what, I thank God I got what I got. See, and we have to learn, well, we're going to read this in a little bit, but we have to learn to be thankful for what we have. It might not be exactly what we want, but we've got to be thankful for what we have. And see, in, in, in a lot of people, you know, the mindset of a lot of people is, I want more. See, it's, it's, again, it's the, it's the foundation of greed. I've got to have more, I've got to have more, I've got to have more. Listen to what he said. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing the gain is godliness from such withdrawal thyself. We see here a picture of what today we would call the gospel of greed. The gospel of greed. The preaching in churches that tells you that you got to have more. That you got to have more. You got to have more. More stuff. More stuff. Now, now if, if, if God gives you the opportunity to advance yourself, to, to get a better job, to make a little more money. That's, thank God, He gives us the power to get wealth. He gives us the power to be able to, to receive more. And He can bless us with more if He wants to. I'm not saying we should walk around and say, Oh God, you know, help me live in poverty. So I can, I'm not saying that. God can bless us. He'll give us what we need. We've got a roof over our head, clothes on our back. He'll give us what we need. And if He gives us the opportunity to get that, we shouldn't turn it down. 
But what happens is we become driven. We become driven. We live in a culture where we are driven to get, we're told, we're, we got it bombarded in our mind. Every time you turn on the TV and you watch a commercial, we, we, we get bombarded with this idea that you need more. They spend billions of dollars trying to convince you that you need stuff that you don't have money to buy. That's what they do. So they say, well, well, we'll give you the money to buy and you can pay us back at about 20% interest. Okay. It's, it's, it's a mindset that's in our culture, that's in our society. And, and it's, it's in the church. And it's, it, it has permeated everything. People that teach that gain is godliness. In other words, people that will tell you that if you, if you, really, if you really got faith, and this, this goes with all the, 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 you know, the, uh, the seed faith stuff that we hear. Well, if you plant your seed, then, then you'll receive you know, blessings and your family will be healed and your kids will be saved and you plant your $1,000 or 58 or 300 whatever it is, they all got their own little, you know, their little gimmick. It's the gospel of greed. It's preaching that gain is godliness. That it, it says that you can measure your relationship with God by how much you have. And it fits right in with our culture. With our free enterprise American culture. You know, a culture of greed. He says, from, when you hear these people, from such withdraw thyself. Turn the, the channel. Turn the TV off. Stop listening. Stop reading. When somebody comes to you and tells you, and they start pumping you for money, and tells you that the, your, your, your relationship with God is based upon how much money you have and how much money you give, it's time to turn the channel. Now, we believe in giving. Well, I, I believe in tithing. I believe that God blesses our giving. That's a biblical principle. But they've taken that. They'll take, and just like what Satan does, he'll take God's Word and he'll twist it 12 different ways to make it say exactly what he wants, his, uh, wants it to say. From such, Paul is very clear. I wish, I wish this message would go out to all Christians in America because I can't believe that they're still listening and watching some of the people that have been busted. Yeah. Ripping people off. Yet they, you know, three or four years later they come back on and they still, and people call them up for the miracle water and for the miracle seed and this and all the junk that they send them because they send them 20 bucks and 40 bucks and 50 bucks and 100 bucks. Why, why, what's wrong with that? You know, fool me one time, shame on you. Second time, I ought to learn. I don't know better. This is what he's saying. He says, From such withdraw thyself. And he says this in verse 6. And this should be the banner. See, this, you won't read this in United Still Workers magazine. You won't read this in the, you know, uh, the, the, the Teamsters magazine. This is not their platform. But this is God's platform. But godliness with contentment. Godliness with contentment. If you can live a godly life and be content with the state that you're in. Now listen, again, this does not mean that you should not try to better yourself. If, you know, get a, uh, an education, a better job. That doesn't mean we should just like crawl in the hole and stay there. If God gives us the opportunity to better ourselves... That's, that's good. Paul said in another place, he says, if you're a slave and you get a chance to be free, be free. You know, go ahead. God can give you that opportunity. This says we shouldn't take this and just crawl in a hole and just be, you know, be like a little clam in a hole, you know, just never change. You know, God wants us uh, to, to take any opportunity He gives us. But contentment isn't, isn't just sitting back. It's not laziness. It's just sitting back and saying, okay, here I am. It's being willing to accept the place that God has you at this time. Because if you're his child, you know what? Where you're at is where he wants you to be at. If you're his, if you're dwelling in, his, in, the, in the center of his will and in his spirit, where you're at is where he wants you to be at. If you've been missing him, if you haven't been listening to him, well then he'll deal with you a little bit. And you know, there's only one thing I'll never be content with. I'll never be content with my relationship with him. It can always be better. I can always read more. I can always pray more. I can always learn more. I can always grow more in him. But everything else, where he has me, in the house I'm in, with the stuff I got, now if, I, if I need something, I'll say, Lord, I, I could use this or could use that. But I'm going to be content. I'm going to be satisfied with where he has me. And it's hard to do nowadays. Because we get bombarded, as I said, with, with millions and billions of dollars worth of advertising telling us, don't be content. You need more. Don't be content with the car you got. You need to buy this new car over here. Uh, you know, that you can't afford. But, but we'll, we'll finance it for you. 
We'll make it. We'll, we'll let you have it. Don't be content with a house. Or you need to buy a bigger house. Look at what's happened to the real estate market in this country. What's happened? People buying houses they couldn't afford, taking loans that they couldn't pay back. Everything was inflated. And then when the, when the, when the bubble popped, people borrowed money to buy a $2 million house, and the house was only worth 200000 They were paying more than what the house was worth. That's what's happening. That's the way, that's what greed does. If somebody made a lot of money. Somebody made a whole lot of money off that deal. And a lot of people paid for it. Why? Because we live in a culture of greed. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If you can live a godly life, if you can live a life where you glorify God, and you can be content, you can accept your circumstances. You can accept where God has you at any given time and be content and be satisfied with what God has for you. If you can live that life, then you are way further ahead than people that got billions of dollars. Because if you can be happy and blessed and content and satisfied and, and, and just accepting where you are, the Bible tells us that's worth more than anything. See, and we have to drill that in our minds because the whole world is telling us something different. Sometimes I'm, I find it hard to be content. I mean, God's blessed us. We have everything we need. We're, we're not wanting anything. But sometimes it's hard. When you, when you get your eyes off of the Lord and get your eyes out of His Word and start listening and hearing to what the world's saying, you can start thinking, man, I wish I had that thing. I wish I had that Cadillac. I wish I had something. You know, I wish I had a... But God says, don't you have everything you need? Shouldn't you be content? Shouldn't you say, thank you, Lord, for what I have? God, if you give me, well, you know, if I want that, I'm just going to have to go out and get another job and make some money and do it. You know, if you give me the opportunity, fine, but if not, I'm going to be content with what I can. Okay? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Why? Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world. Amen. See, this is, this, is good old, this is just good old stuff. This is nothing fancy. This is, this is just good old stuff. When I was born, I had nothing. I had zero. I was born with long hair, you know that? I did. I can show you a picture. I had hair down the middle of my back. That's all I had. That's, I guess that's why I always want to have long hair. But it's a curly, too. But it was, I'll show you the picture. But that's all I had. I didn't have nothing else. You know, my parents had to put clothes on me and give me whatever I had. And I eventually learned how to, you know, make some, you know, get a job and make money and stuff. But, but you know what? When I die, I ain't going to take a stitch with me. Ain't nothing going with me. This, 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 this boy inside this body, when I came into this world, I thank God. You know, my mom and dad conceived me. And I had my beginnings there. When I leave this, my body's going to go on the ground. I'm going to go uh, stand in front of the Lord. I'm not going to have nothing from this place. And neither are you. I thank God that He gives us stuff to be able to live here. He gives us a place to live. He gives us a roof. He gives us food. He gives us clothes. He gives us good friends. He gives us uh, dogs and cats we can play with. He, gives us, he blesses our lives in a lot of different ways. But ultimately, we're going to leave every stitch of it behind. Everything. So, we brought nothing into this world. And it's certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich. Now listen. Here it is. See, because we look every day, we see these wealthy people. People with unbelievable amounts of money. This, I mean millions and some of them got billions of dollars. Never have to worry one day about paying an electric bill. Never have to worry one day about the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the car insurance. Never have to worry about, you know, is gas going up 10 cents. Don't worry a thing. They just have money, unbelievably wealthy. And sometimes if you look at them people, you think, wow, wouldn't it be something if I had a million dollars in the bank? Well, what could I do? Huh? And, and, and if you let yourself start thinking that, one of the very first messages I ever preached was from Psalm 73. When I beheld the prosperity of the wicked, my feet almost slipped. If you start looking, and looking at them, you start reading the, the glam magazines, you know, when they show all these jet setters, you know, flying here and flying there, just, you know, jewels and blah, blah, blah. You know what? When they die, they ain't going to take nothing with them either. Not a single thing. Okay? Having food and clothes, let us therewith be content. 
But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in the destruction and perdition. You remember here a few years back, there was a TV show on, and I never watched an episode. I might have watched about 15 minutes of it. But they took two of these uh, debutantes, wealthy young girls from family, you know, uh, wealthy families. And they made them work like in a Wendy's. I mean, here's, here's, here's these women that probably never picked up a broom in their lives. Okay, they probably never had to, had to wash a load of clothes. They put them, they probably never had to wash a dish. They put them in the Wendy's or McDonald's or somewhere. And oh, I just watched a few minutes of this and that was like... Uh. <laughs> Foolish, hurtful lust. Listen to what all these wealthy people do. Well, how they spend their money. You know, just lavish, just, just ridiculous things. You, you hear these stories about... Who, what, 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 what was her name? Got caught shoplifting? I mean, they've got like a jillion dollars in a bank and she's shoplifting. Yeah. Foolish, hurtful, lust. Greed. Just sick. They're, they're, they're caught up. When people have extreme wealth, there's a danger. There's a danger of getting caught up and just taking everything for granted and just doing whatever they feel like doing because they got money and they can get a lawyer and they can get out and they can do this and they can do that. I'll never forget uh, a friend of mine I know is incarcerated. And in, in where he was incarcerated, one of the prisoners there was John DuPont. You ever hear that name? Yeah. Wealthy. Unbelievably wealthy. Owned the DuPont, you know, chemical thing. He killed a man. Uh, I don't know if you remember this story. This is maybe 10, 15 years ago. He murdered somebody. He ended up in jail. Now, if that had been you or me, I mean, he could afford the lawyer, so he didn't get the, you know, the death penalty. But he, he ended up in jail. I'm thinking, here's this guy with this un incredible amounts of money. And he killed somebody. And all the money in the world could not get him out of a life sentence. Foolishness. Stupid, you know, people that have all this money, they don't think. This is what he says. And this is verse 10. And we all know this. This is just good old stuff. For the love of money. The love of money. Not money. Money's okay. But the love of money is the root of all evil. Some translations say all kinds of evil. The love of money. Money's all right. You can use money. God can give you money. He can take it. He gives some folks more than others because they use it better. You know. He can give money, take money. Money isn't evil. Money, you can use money for a lot of good things. But when you fall in love with it. Because when you start to fall in love with it, guess what? You don't like to part with it. When you fall in love with it, you want more of it. You know. I've, I love my wife. I can't get enough of my wife. I love my wife. If you love somebody, you can't get enough of them. If you love money, you can't get enough of it. And you want more and more and more. This Bernie Madoff, who was a wealthy man, a billion dollar Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme, in case you don't know what that is, that's when, when somebody uh, tries to get you, if I go to Carol and I say, Carol, if you give me $100,000, then I'll, uh, you'll get money back. See? So then, uh, uh, then I'll go to Patty and I'll say, Patty, if you give me $100,000, you'll get money back. And I'll take the money she gives me to give to her, but I'll keep some for myself. See, so it's like a big pyramid, okay? You know what I'm saying? That's what the point is. Billions of dollars. This guy didn't need that money. He was wealthy. But he had to have more. People got to have more. They got to have more. They got to have more. It says, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they've erred from the faith, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Do you know they say that when people, and this is a high percentage of people who hit the lottery, end up bankrupt, end up divorced. Some of them have even committed suicide. And you think, well man, if I could, man, if I hit the lottery for like, you know, 10 million bucks, that'll, that'll make me happy. They've ended up bankrupt, divorced, committed suicide. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all 
kinds of evil. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. The more money you got, the more you got to worry about keeping it. The more you got to worry about somebody stealing it. The more you got to worry about somebody ripping you off. But he says this, and we're going to close. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. We need to run. We need to run from the love of money. Money can be a great thing. But if we fall in love with it, we need to stop. If we find ourselves yearning for the things, just, just coveting and being envious of what people have, we need to stop and we need to take a good look at ourselves. Because the society of greed that we live in, may perhaps we've allowed ourselves to, to get caught up in all the craziness that's going on in our society. I was talking with somebody uh, today about how there was, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people had some kind of, uh, some, some, some kind of, uh, you know, standards and morals. But as the years go on, as things change on the outside, we tend to compromise. We tend to, to lighten up a little bit. We tend to allow ourselves to, to get blended into the world. And we find ourselves acting just like them. They, a man came to Jesus one time. And he said, Jesus... Will you please go talk to my brother? Our father died. And he's not giving me my share of the inheritance. Have you ever heard that story before? Oh my. When somebody dies, it'll bring out the best in people and the worst in people. Especially if there's a lot of stuff to split up. Jesus says, man, who made me a divider of goods over you? Who put me in that position? Says, man of God. And we could say, woman of God, too. Flee these things and follow after, what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's, that's what we need to covet. That's what we need to fix our affections on. That's what we need to fall in love with. Those fruits of the Spirit. God, I'll never be content with the amount of fruit of the Spirit in my life. I always need more. I need more love. I need more joy. I need more patience. I need more long -term. I need more of the fruit of the Spirit. That's the only thing I'm lacking. And I can only get that by walking in the Spirit. By reading His Word. By understanding His Word. He says, But thou, O man of God, flee after these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickens or brings to life all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that to Timothy, and he's saying that to us. The Lord wants us to have a good confession. The good confession doesn't come from having lots of money. The good confession comes from having a lot of fruit of the Spirit. So in this culture of greed that we live in, in this, in this time where people are trying to get ahead and get rich and get, you know, step over whoever they can to get where they need to be, I hope and pray that those of the faith, those in our congregation, and churches throughout this, this city and this valley, and I know some good pastors who love the Lord, I pray that people, when they look at the church, you know, when I worked in the mill, and again, Dale will probably tell you this, if you tell somebody you're a Christian, the first thing they start thinking about is money. You know, you, one time I told a guy, we were going to go down and see somebody, I forget who it was, somebody was some evangelist was coming there. I was going to say, well, I'm going to go see so-and-so. And they said, well, hold on to your wallet. <laughs> that's what they told me. Because that's the first thing they think. They got this idea that religion is just another racket. Well, religion is. But Christ isn't. Hold fast. Here's our, here's our command for tonight. Hold fast a good profession. Confess your faith. Be content with what God has given you. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Don't allow yourself to fall in love 
with money. Instead, fall in love with the fruit of the Spirit. Look at verse 17. Just, just a few more and we're closing. It says, Timothy, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. You know, if God blesses somebody with money, it's usually because they give it away. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Beloved, I pray that we would get our focus on what God has done and we would be thankful for the things that we have and be content and give Him glory for all the good things that He's given us. If He opens up a door for us to get more, that's fine. If He doesn't, that's okay too. But we need to be about our Father's business. Make a good profession of your faith to all those who are around you. And I believe God will bless you. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, for your word tonight. Father, I thank you, Lord, for meeting all our needs. I thank you for providing for us, for all things. God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us, whatever state we're in, whatever condition that we're in. Father, there are those of us that have very definite needs in here. For different things in our lives, Father, we know that you're able to meet those needs. But Father, I pray that you will help us even though we might feel like we have a need, that you will help us still be grateful, first of all, for knowing you, first of all, for being born again and saved, that we would be grateful for the things you have given us and the things you have granted to us. And you would help us, Lord, keep our eyes fixed and focused on your purpose, not on the things of the world, that you would help us just push away all the... All the all the enticements of the world that we should, you know, to, to have greed, to want more, and to want more, and to want more. And that we should be satisfied and content. And if we have a need, it says in your word, Father, if we have needs, we can make those needs known unto you. Father, there are some things that you need you, you will meet, and some things you might say, wait. But if we're in the center of your will, there's no better place we can be. Help us be content with all things. Help us realize that our relationship with you is not based on how much we have in the world. This is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and give you glory in Jesus' name. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being here.